Back in 1964, in New York City, they hosted the World's Fair, 140 pavilions strong. It featured some of the latest technology from the world's biggest companies. GM was there featuring some of their latest products. IBM was starting to demonstrate what computers could do. And Ford was there showing how well they could move people around, introducing their brand new sports car called the Mustang. And then long before online dating was ever around, Parker Penn had this tent where you could go in and you could list all your interests and they would assign you a pen pal from around the world. What a great day that was. The whole fair was based on the theme of progress of humanity. We've done so much. We're gone so far. The world's shrinking, and it's becoming a great future for us. We can only imagine what tomorrow holds. Probably the only reason any of us even think or even remotely know anything about the 1964 World's Fair is because you've been to Disneyland or Disney World, and you've ridden on the People Mover, or you've You've been there on America's longest-running theater show. You've been on the, the circle or the carousel of progress. And even sung along, there's a great, big, beautiful tomorrow. 1964 and 65, that was a great time of excitement and joy. Our country was making progress. Economically, we were making progress. Technologically, we were making progress. The space era was dawning. Technology was going to make life so easy. They even speculated that we wouldn't work as much in the future. Everyone was imagining this world that was becoming smaller and smaller, and we're all going to live in harmony. Fast forward to 1967, and all that excitement, all that joy, all that anticipation of a great, big, beautiful tomorrow came to a crashing end. All you had to do was speak one country's name, and you would forget all of this progress. All you had to say was, Vietnam, because suddenly the ugly side of progress was put on our TV screens every night. We saw this technology that was supposed to shrink the world and unite the world. We saw it brutally destroy young lives. The dream of a big, bright, beautiful tomorrow, it ended in Vietnam for over 2 million people. Last week, we began a series working through the book of Philippians looking through this letter written so many years ago, asking, can we as human beings find lasting, invincible joy? And if so, where can we find it at? Can we find it in technology? Can we find it in human progress? Can we find it in our advancement, in our achievement? In 2022, we're still told those same things we were told in 1964. There's a great, big, beautiful tomorrow. College is going to be free. Cell phones and the internet are making international business easier than ever, and it's the norm. Electric vehicles are going to save the environment. They're going to stop natural disasters. We're going to feed the world with bioengineering. Farming is going to become more sustainable, and it's going to be more efficient. But many of us know from history, somebody's going to pay that college bill eventually. Some of us are asking what's going to happen when the battery in the EV wears out. And what happens when bioengineering is, is used as a weapon. The world tells us that we can find joy in progress, that we can find joy in our career, we can find joy in education, we can find it in technology. But history tells us, just like that in the 1960s, this type of joy can quickly be flipped and become misery when circumstances change. Over 2,000 years ago, this letter that we know as the book of Philippians, it speaks of a different kind of progress, a progress that actually does bring joy, a progress that in spite of what circumstances you face, you can have invincible joy. Last week, we read the introduction to this, the greeting to this letter that Paul wrote, and we said that joy is found in participating in the gospel. Joy is found when we hook and hook our lives to Jesus, and we die to sin, and we allow Jesus to raise us to new life. Now we're going to move into the next part of the letter, the body of the letter. The Philippians, the people there at this church, were concerned about Paul because he's in prison. So they've sent one of their 
congregants up to visit with him named Epaphroditus. He takes a monetary gift to them, a financial gift, and he takes it to Paul and and he asks, how are you doing? And he's supposed to take back this letter and tell them how Paul is doing. And that's where we pick up today. The congregation wants to know, Paul, are you cold? Are you are you warm there in prison? Are you eating well? Are you sick? Are you well? What's going on with you? And Paul writes back with a very surprising response. We're going to be in Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 through 17 this morning. If you have your Bible, I encourage you to, to read along to find Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 through 17. If you don't have a Bible, there's one in the rack there in front of you. This is what it says. It says, now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually advanced the gospel, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to everyone else that my imprisonment is because I am in Christ. Most of the brothers have gained confidence in the Lord for my imprisonment and dare even more to speak the word fearlessly. To be sure, some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. These preach out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The others proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely thinking that they will cause me trouble in my imprisonment. Last week, we, we kind of left off saying the gospel is where joy is found. We said the whole letter of Philippians is tied up in this word called cruciformity. Tying my life and living out Jesus' life on the cross. Dying to sin and rising to a new life that is now submitted to God. And here we see Paul speaking and saying, Joy is not found in my circumstances. Joy is not found in our circumstances. That's the first thing we take from this portion of the letter. Is that joy does not come from what's happening in my life. And what situation I find myself in. Look at how Paul says this. He says, what has happened to me? Or other translations simply say, look at my circumstances. He doesn't answer the question they've asked him. He doesn't say, man, it's really cold in this, this prison. Or it's damp in here. I need some blankets. Or he doesn't say the guards are hard and insulting. He doesn't say I'm on death row just waiting to die. He doesn't mention any of those things. And the reason is, is because his joy doesn't lie in what's happening to him. His joy doesn't lie in the circumstances that he's facing. His joy lies in progress. His joy rides on the gospel moving forward. He's truly found something, that, just like we sing about, he's found something that's better than life. He's found something worth living for. He's found something worth dying for, and that is seeing the gospel, the good news of Jesus, Jesus' message. And he died to transfer us out of slavery to sin into a life free to do what God wants us to do. He's found joy in that, and he realizes this is worth living everything for. Paul says, I've found my deep and lasting fulfillment by seeing lives rescued out of this slavery to sin. Nothing compares to that kind of joy. If you've ever seen someone and been a part of someone's life being transformed by Christ, you know there is no greater joy than seeing God move and work through you. That's what Paul's saying. He said, it doesn't matter if this jail is cold or if it's harsh guards. It doesn't matter. I'm seeing the gospel go forward. I'm seeing this message of Jesus, of how he can rescue you from sin. I'm seeing that go forward, and that is what really matters. I believe so few of us today are experiencing a lack of joy because we haven't let that gospel, that message, really get to the core of our life. We're walking through life just trying to survive. We're on a roller coaster. Good circumstances, we're up. Bad circumstances, we're down. We're just on this roller coaster. Paul says, I don't have to be on a roller coaster. I can have joy, consistent, invincible joy, because I know I'm in Christ, and I'm seeing what his message can do and how it can change other people. We bought into that lie that, if we progress in our education, if we progress in technology, if we progress in our career and our relationships, life's going to be great. No, it's not. All those things can fall apart in a moment. The message of Philippians is true joy is found in Jesus and in his purposes. He is the only thing worth living and dying for. 
Jesus said this over and over again in the parables. He says, there's a rich man. He's out and he finds in the field, he finds a treasure. And he sells everything he has to buy that treasure. He gives up everything because he's found something worth living for. He says the kingdom of God is like that. Church joy isn't found in what's happening in your life. It's not found in your circumstances. Joy is found in the good news of Jesus. That he laid down his life so you could be free from sin. And man, we should be filled with joy just like Paul is. No matter what circumstance we say, if the gospel is moving forward in our life. Paul's mind is fixated, or he's constantly thinking of what Jesus has done for him. Instead of thinking about his circumstances, he's thinking about what Jesus has done for him. He is really living out what he wrote in Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. He says, if you've been raised with Christ, seek the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. Paul never got this out of his head. Paul used the words, I am the worst of all sinners. And he never got it out of his head that God took the worst of all sinners and radically changed his life, rescued him from the dominion of darkness and transferred him into the light. Paul never got his mind off of that. I know a lot of us, our minds race with what to do and um, we just have to-do list, and we have honey-do list, and we have all these things in our mind, and we're just constantly running in our mind. Paul let the gospel, the good news of Jesus, be at the forefront of what he's thinking about. He isn't concerned about the circumstances. His concern is the redeeming work of Jesus Christ and the advancement of that work. A lot of us have our minds fixated on personal progress, make the grade, save for retirement, have enough to live on, whatever the next achievement is in life. But if you read on in chapter 3, Paul says you can achieve it all, and it's garbage. It's garbage compared to knowing Jesus Christ. It is garbage compared to seeing the gospel go forward and change people's lives and change your life. Church, we must find habits and disciplines and routines and practices that help us fixate our mind, to put our mind, to set our mind on God's redeeming work both in us and through us. That means we've got to spend some time daily hearing God's message through his word into our life. It also means that we've got to spend some time boldly sharing the gospel. We can't just sit on the gospel. We've got to take it to the world around us. God's purposes are to advance his kingdom, to move his kingdom forward And he's given us that great responsibility to spread this message of Jesus, that he can change your life. He can transfer you from death and darkness and sinful living into a life of hope and of light. Second thing we see in this passage here is that God uses all kinds of circumstances to move his gospel message forward. He uses the different things that can happen in our life to make progress with that message of good news. First, God uses suffering. It's obviously, it's obvious to us that Paul is suffering. He's in prison. The circumstances are far from ideal, but he says, I can take joy in this. The message of Jesus is moving forward. It's moving forward throughout the imperial guard. God has put me in this place so the guards can hear the gospel and their lives are being changed because of it. Other prisoners in this place are hearing this good news and their life are changing because of it. And then Christians that are living in this city, wherever he's in prison, whether it's Rome or Ephesus, they are becoming emboldened. They are encouraged by Paul's fearlessness and they are becoming fearless to share the gospel. Paul's saying, my circumstances, this suffering, God has allowed this to happen to me for his purposes, for good. He's saying, I'm seeing all this good come out of my suffering. He goes on and and says, talks a little bit about those that are preaching Christ from sincerity. He's saying it's making a difference. My circumstances that are far from ideal are making a difference in other believers' lives. They're spreading the gospel. But then he talks about a group of people that they're sharing the gospel with 
poor motives. Now, I know a lot of you don't spend a lot of time with pastors, but I had the privilege of going to seminary, and I got to spend a lot of time with guys that were training to be pastors, and you talk about some rivalry. There's some real rivalry. You got to get a bunch of pastors playing basketball with each other, and uh, fights will break out, and all kinds of things will happen, believe it or not. I remember one time here in Paducah, a pastor of a very large church, he said these words. He said, the churches will never, ever work together in this town because there's way too much competition and rivalry among our churches in this town. That's what was happening back here in Paul's day. You had these guys that were like, you know what? Paul's in jail. Ha ha. I don't like him anyways. I got a personal beef with him, and we don't like him, so I'm going to go out. I'm going to draw a bigger crowd and throw it in his face and be like, Paul, you can't do this. We're better than you. Paul's saying, I got this group of people that are in opposition to me. They are opposing me. They got a personal beef with me. And they don't, they don't have a theological problem with him. They don't have an ethical problem with him. That's Galatians and 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. It's a personal thing with Paul. They're teaching truth, but for whatever reason, they don't like him. Paul says, even that, even when I'm opposed, if it's making the gospel go forward, then that's great. God uses all these circumstances to make gospel progress. You can look at the fastest growing church today. It's in Iran, a place where it is opposed to the gospel. It's illegal to trust the gospel, and yet God is using these circumstances to advance his kingdom. The world tells us to avoid pain, to avoid suffering, to avoid opposition. But the Bible tells us no matter what we face, God has allowed it, and he uses it for a greater purpose. God didn't hear what the doctor had to say and be like, oh my gosh, throw his hands up. He allowed it to happen. He didn't stress out over it. The ridicule of co-workers doesn't shock him. The opposition to the culture, to the church, doesn't surprise him at all. He's allowed these circumstances to happen in our lives for his purpose. Whether those are good circumstances, or those are suffering circumstances, or we face opposition, or pain, or heartache, or success. He's allowed every one of those circumstances for a greater purpose. He's used those, and most often he's using those circumstances to move the gospel forward. Romans 5, 3 and 4, Paul is talking about joy, and he says, not only can we rejoice in our salvation, but we can rejoice and boast in our afflictions, because we know that affliction produces endurance, endurance produces proven character, and proven character produces hope. Paul's saying, man, all these things that are coming at me, God's using them. God's at work in them. And he's using them to change other people's lives. The great missionary Adonai Judson, he was called to, he originally was going to go to China, but he ended up in this country called Burma or Myanmar is what it's called today. He ends up there and he loses his wife. Some of his kids pass away. He goes through all kinds of suffering. He doesn't see a convert for years and years and years. But he said it's worth it. The joy is worth it to see these people's lives changed by the good news of Jesus. He found that secret that Paul had found. That no matter what circumstances fade, if we are focused on the gospel and the message of Jesus, we will see joy in even the hardest of circumstances because we found something worth living and dying for. What that means to us is we have to submit to the circumstances God allows in our life. And regardless of what they are, we're on mission in the middle of those circumstances. That's a buzzword in the church world today, being on mission. You know, you may have heard that. One of the organizations puts out some material with that, beyond mission, missional living. What that simply means is living your life as a missionary would. If you were to show up at your work, how would a missionary, if their livelihood depended on that, how would they live? That's what that means. Paul finds himself in a prison. He says, I'm the missionary here at the prison. You find yourself at your job, you're the missionary there at that job. The reality of this, the reality is this. God has a history of working through adversity to fulfill his purpose. He has worked through adversity all through history to buy people's freedom 
from sin. We could talk about church history. We could walk all through church history and talk about how the persecuted church influenced the culture around it. We could talk about how we see it today in Asia and the Middle East. But the best place to look is the cross. I mean, it doesn't get more adverse than that. And God used those adverse circumstances to rescue billions of people from their sin. God has a history of working through suffering, through pain, through agony to save people from sin. 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but it is the power of God to us who are being saved. God works through adversity. So you may be here today and you may be facing some incredibly hard and difficult circumstances. God's allowed those circumstances to further his kingdom. And his kingdom is where the joy is at. Paul found that secret to invincible joy, letting the gospel progress through his circumstances, letting the gospel work through, letting the message of Jesus go through whatever he faced. The world tells us that you'll find this satisfaction with technology. If you evolve in your relationships, if you progress in your sexuality, you'll find wholeness. It's a lie. Chapter 3, Paul says, I had it. Had it all. Had it all. And it doesn't compare to this joy of letting God work in me and through me and my circumstances. So the gospel takes root in my hard heart and the hard heart of other people. Church, don't try to find your joy in the junk this world offers. Jesus is the only place we can find joy. All that stuff the world offers will leave you hungry and hurting. Jesus is the only place you can find true joy in letting his gospel move through you and work in you. Next, Paul moves on to what the future holds. I don't know how many of you have thought about the future. I think we all think about it a lot. Some of you have received diagnosis or you've gotten news reports that affect your future. I think we're all asking right now, what's the economy going to do? What's the future hold for us? Well, Paul addresses it in verses 18 through 26. He says, what does it matter? Only that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice, yes, and I will continue to rejoice, because I know this will lead to my salvation through your prayers and help from the Spirit of Jesus Christ. My eager expectation and hope is that I will not be ashamed about anything, but now, as always, with courage, Christ will be highly honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Now, if I live on in the flesh, this means fruitful work for me, and I don't know which I should choose. I'm torn between the two. I long to depart and be with Christ, which is far better, but to remain in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. Since I am persuaded of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that because of my coming to you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus may abound. If you're in Jesus, Paul is saying there is a big, bright, beautiful tomorrow. Look at verse 19. It says, whatever happens. Some translations translate the next word. Some say salvation. Others say deliverance. Still others say freedom. And what happened? Did Paul like draw the get out of jail free card from the chance pile? No. Something greater happened. The Greek word there is soteria. It means salvation. And the phrasing is almost exact. It's a book we don't read very often. Job chapter 13, verse 16. For Job is facing all these accusations. All his friends are coming to him, and they're just laying it on me like, you've sinned, you've done wrong, and that's why all this bad stuff's happened to you. But Job responds, says, yes, this will result in my deliverance, for no godless person can appear before him. Job's saying, I've not sinned. God has use these circumstances and will use these circumstances to move his kingdom forward. And I don't understand it, but I'm trusting that one day I will stand before him innocent. Paul's saying the exact same thing. 
It says, don't matter what the world throw at, throws at me, I've got Jesus. And that's all that matters. I'm going to stand before God and be innocent on judgment day, no matter what happens on this earth. A few weeks ago, social media kind of blew up because over in Europe, there was a Van Gogh painting that was up on a museum wall when these protesters went in and they opened up some cans of tomato juice and they threw it on this Van Gogh painting from the 1800s and they glued themselves to the wall. Social media blew up. Oh my goodness, they've ruined this masterpiece. It's destroyed. It's gone. It will never, never be the same again. But the museum was prepared. Every piece of art like that has a small glass plane over it that we can't even see, and it protects it from that. So it wasn't a few hours later they revealed, here's the masterpiece untouched. Aren't you glad someday you can be like that masterpiece? No matter what the world throws at you, they can throw all the tomato juice they want to on you. Christ takes it. He takes all that sin, and you get to stand before God innocent. Paul can say that because he says, I want Christ to be honored in my body in verse 20. It all hinges on that. That's what it means to be a follower of Jesus, is to say, I want Christ to be exalted. I want Christ to be made much of in my life, in life or in death. Paul says, whatever comes, I want my life to exalt him. If my life's exalting Jesus, then there's going to come a day I'm going to stand before him, and I will be pronounced innocent before God, and nothing this world throws at me can take it away. That's a constant theme of his writings. Constantly through Paul's writings in Galatians 2.20, he says, I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me, and the life I now live in the body I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What about you? Do you look forward to the day of judgment? Is it a day of delight or a day of dread? There's no dread or fear if you've lived your life to honor Christ and everything that you do. One pastor talks about magnifying and glorifying Christ like a microscope and a telescope. A telescope takes things that are really far away and lets us see them as they really are. It takes some planet that's huge, that's way out there, and it brings us so we can see that planet just like it really is. A microscope, on the other hand, still magnifies, but it takes something that's very, very small, and it blows it up, makes it bigger than it really is. Some of us are living like a microscope. We're taking all the circumstances in our life, and we're blowing them up making them bigger than they should be. We should be a telescope that takes God, who is huge and massive, and lets people see him as he really is. So which are you today, a telescope or a microscope? I know some of you are facing hard days, difficult circumstances. But listen to what Paul is saying. He's saying, if you live to make much of Jesus, then dementia can't take away being with Jesus forever. Prison can't keep the gospel shut up. Health issues won't affect your standing before God. Opposition and being made fun of, they don't matter when you walk forever with Jesus. Nothing can take that away. But it hinges on what will we say? Will we say with Paul, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And then Paul tells us his desire. He says, really, I'd rather die and go to heaven. I mean, that's a big deal. He's like, that's, that would be amazing. Get out of all this mess. I'm tired. I've struggled. I've fought. I'm in jail, and I'm ready to go home. But notice where he lands. I'm going to live. Paul sees that living as a servant is more the sacrifice than dying as the martyr. Look at verse 24. He says, I want to stay and be a servant to the gospel. I want to stay and be a servant to the church. I want to stay and be a servant to Christ. God doesn't put you in circumstances so you can just sit there and wish to die and get out of them. God hasn't put you where you're at today just so you can be like, well, I'm just sitting here waiting to die. He's put you here for a reason. He's put you in these circumstances for a reason. 
And he's allowed these circumstances to come to your life so you can be more like Jesus and you can serve to advance his gospel. So let's follow Paul's example and live as servants of Christ, building up others, discipling others, telling lost people about Jesus and the hope that he offers. But notice how Paul got to this point. He didn't get to this point alone. It says, by your prayers and by the Holy Spirit. Church, we need to pray for each other. We spend a lot of time praying that God would alleviate circumstances. Now, I'm not saying don't pray for sick people. Pray for sick people, yes. And pray that, that people are healed, yes. But we also need to pray for endurance. Maybe God's given us this circumstance to build the gospel in us or to spread the gospel to other people. Maybe we need to endure through this circumstance. So let's pray for one another. Pray that God heals, but also pray that God will give us the endurance to face whatever he wants us to face to advance his gospel. Remember, his son faced the cross. And that's how billions of people were rescued from hell. Maybe he's put you through some difficult circumstances to rescue others from the same fate of hell. Let's pray for one another. And then finally, in verses 27 through 30, we get to actually Paul addressing the congregation. He finally moves and starts talking to them and not talking about his circumstances. Verse 27, just one thing. As citizens of heaven, live your life worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or am absent, I will hear about you, that you are standing firm in one spirit and one accord, contending together for the faith of the gospel, not being frightened in any way by your opponents. This is a sign of destruction for them, but of your salvation, and this is from God. For it has been granted to you on Christ's behalf, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. Since you are engaged in the same struggle that you saw I had and now hear that I have. Paul says, whatever the future holds, live worthy of the gospel. Live as a citizen of heaven, under the authority of Jesus, letting his word take priority in your life. Here's the thing about the gospel and the good news. Jesus said this several times. He said, he who has been given much of much will be required. Church, we've been entrusted with the good news of Jesus. We've been entrusted. He has given us new life. If we've been entrusted with so much, that means much is expected. The old saying from Spider-Man, with great power comes great responsibility. It's true. We've been entrusted with this good news. That Jesus has rescued us from death, from hell. There's an expectation to live like it. Paul is aiming this right at behavior. He's saying, man, if you've gotten the gospel, if you've trusted in Jesus Christ, and he's transferred you from the kingdom of darkness into his kingdom, if he's made a life change in you, then show it by the way you live, by the actions, by the attitudes that you hold. And as a church, be unified and advance the gospel fearlessly. Church, we've got to fearlessly and boldly share the gospel. We've talked about who's your one several times, having one person that you're going to pray for, that God would give you the opportunity to share your faith with them. The easy way out is to say, oh, just invite people to church. You can invite them to church, but you need to tell them the gospel. You are a witness. Acts 1.8 says we're witnesses. We've witnessed the gospel in our life. We've witnessed Jesus change us. Let's be a witness and share that. Advance the gospel. So today our musicians are going to come, and they're going to lead us in a time of response. The first question we ask after reading this, have you trusted Jesus? Have you received this good news? That Jesus died on that cross. He took your punishment on that cross. And he rose again on the third day. 
to give you a new life? Have you trusted him and have you received that free gift? If you haven't, then today, as we sing, you walk up front and we'll talk. You and I will just talk about how you can trust Jesus. The second question we ask is, we're facing hard days. Every one of us has our own difficulties, our own storms that we're walking through. God's put you in that spot. Instead of saying, God, take this away, I mean, it's okay to ask that. But also, God, what do you want to do in this? How are you wanting to use me as a vessel to change other people's lives, to, to let your gospel change me, to let your gospel change other people? Maybe you need to ask that question today as we sing. And then finally, are you living worthy of the gospel? You've been entrusted with this good news and this life-changing message. Live like it. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word today. We thank you. And no matter what we face, no matter what's thrown at us, we still have a home in you. You promise never to leave us nor forsake us. God, we are so grateful for that. We ask today that as we respond, that you would move in our hearts, that our minds would be open, our hearts would be open, and we would do what you ask us to do in this moment. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and let's sing. You respond as God leads you. From the highest of heights to the depths of the sea. Creations revealing your majesty. From the colors of fall to the fragrance of spring. Every creature unique in the song that it sings, all exclaiming, indescribable, uncontainable. You place the stars in the sky and you know them by name. You are amazing. your bulletin you'll see that we are having trunk or treat a week from tomorrow on the 31st from 6 to 8 p.m. Uh, if you haven't signed up yet to decorate a car and to be up here to hand out candy please do that we'll also need some help with some security 
and uh, registration. So if you want to help with registration, see me. If you can help with security, see David Helton, and they can get you right in the right place for both of those things. We are asking that everybody be here around 515. I know some of y'all are getting off work at that time, but be here around 515 so we can be set up and ready to go at 6. Then also you'll see the shoebox reminder there in your bulletin. Extra shoe boxes are right over here on this table. Grab one of those if you want to pack it in person or if you want to go online, follow that link and you can pack it there online and be able to track it and put different things in it. Let's pray and we will be dismissed. God, we thank you for today. We thank you for your love for us, that you were willing to die for the worst of all sinners. God, we thank you that, as the song says, as vile as that thief on the cross We were as vile as he, and you offered him paradise, God. We thank you that you offer us paradise, and you offer us a better future. God, we pray that we would share that hope that we have with the world around us. Give us boldness. Help us to fearlessly share that good news. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.